Hi. Um, today we have a talk by Simon. Yep. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> As you've heard, my name is Simon. Uh, I'm an uh, open source developer. Uh, in my day job, I'm uh, a lecturer in cultural anthropology. Uh, and as you can probably tell from my t-shirt, I'm very interested in writing systems and different languages uh, around the world. I wonder if you've ever wondered what happens when you hit some keys on your keyboard or get some text from a file or from the internet. Um, how that then becomes displayed, whether it's on the screen or in print. Um, we're going to look at that today. We're going to see the journey of a word as it travels through um, a computer and gets displayed or printed. Actually, we're going to do four words. Um, the first word we're going to look at is a very simple one. It's the word official. The second word we're going to look at is the word wisdom, but we're going to look at it in Sanskrit. Um, this is an interesting word for a couple of reasons. There are two bugs in this. Uh, the first bug is maybe not an obvious one. Um, I've actually spelt it wrong. Um, I was doing some editing of a book for an author and they said, oh, put diacritics on the J and the A. And I think they probably meant to say put diacritics on the N and the A. Um, but it's very interesting for our purposes because it exposes another bug. Can anyone see a bug in that word? It should be glaringly obvious. Yeah, the kerning between the A and the J. This is a bug in the text layout system of OS X core text. Um, if I were to render that word in the same font, same Unicode uh, code points in Linux, it would look like this. So they say that Macs for designers, it's not true. <laughs> Linux has got this one sorted. But this reminds us that text layout doesn't just happen. Yep, the software that's making those uh, letters appear in the right places in the right order at the right time. So the second word that we're going to look at today is the word prajna. Um, the third word that we will look at is the word algorithm. Algorithm, as you know, is an Arabic word. Um, and so we'll look at it in Arabic because uh, that adds a few more peculiarities to the text processing uh, stream. And the final word that I want to look at today is the word software. But just to be interesting, we're going to look at the word software in the Telugu language of India. Uh, I'm sure you know Telugu. It's the 15th most commonly spoken language in the world. It's got 76 million speakers. It's not a small language by any means. but. Uh, the way that uh, Telugu is written is very interesting. And how does a computer deal with this? Let me tell you how I got into all of this stuff. A few years ago, by uh, a strange uh, sequence of events, I ended up writing a, uh, a layout system, a, a, a typesetting uh, package. Kind of like tech, but better. And because I'm not talking about style today, I don't need to justify that statement. Um, I'm not going to be talking about how it works and how it does what it does uh, so much, but, but I want to talk about the input, the text that goes into it, the font that goes into it, and the output, the PDF. Um, because actually it turns out that I've needed to learn a lot more about how each of these things operate, and, and it turns out there are actually really interesting bits of uh, technology behind them. And um, so this is the process. Sile will uh, take some text, take some fonts, merge them together, do various things that the languages of that text require, break it into lines, break it into pages, ship it out to PDF. Um, and it's a very similar process when text comes in from the internet, gets laid out on your web browser, and gets displayed on the screen. So we're looking at this whole thing called uh, text layout and particularly complex text layout. But let's start simple. Let's start with the word official. And the question is, how is this text represented to a computer? Official, as I said, it's very simple. It's just uh, the Latin character set. It's covered by ASCII, which is a system of coding that we've had for 30 years now. Um, but something is different about this text. Uh, if you look at the text on the left, the FFI 
is rendered as one glyph, a ligature. How did that get there? We didn't press the FFI button, um, but the text is stored as uh, simple Latin code points. Let's go to Prash now, because that's a bit interesting. Uh, you should know, I hope, that we're now in a Unicode world. Uh, we're beyond ASCII. And uh, Unicode is a system that assigns numbers to all of the characters in all of the languages that have been encoded so far. And the idea is to encode every single language that, and every single script uh, that we are going to use a computer to process. Um, but Unicode doesn't actually encode every single character. For instance, there is no J tilde in the Unicode character set. It's not encoded. So how did I get that text in there? Well, Unicode has a system called uh, combining marks. So you, to encode that word, we have the letter dotless J. We then have a combining tilde which is a special mark that has no width and says this goes with the thing that was before it. Now we don't have a precomposed code point for dotless J with a tilde, but we do have a code point that encodes the A with a macro. Um, this is because Unicode, as well as trying to encode everything that we use, is also trying to uh, be backwards compatible with all of the other encodings that have gone before it. So anything that was ever encoded somewhere needs its own code point. A macron has been, J tilde has not. So that's why you have uh, two different ways of encoding a character with a diacritic. And uh, I'm sure you would know that uh, normally this is uh, laid out in, on a file in, in probably something like UTF-8. UTF-8 is a variable encoding. So some of these characters will have one byte, some of them will have two bytes. I'm not going to go too much into um, the, the different encodings today. Um, but I said that uh, we do have a precomposed character for A with macro. We also have the possibility to encode exactly the same text in a different way. We could encode it as A with a combining macro in just the same way that we've done J with combining tilde. Uh, so any software that deals with Unicode has to deal with the fact that uh, it could be getting the same data in a bunch of different ways. So it has to perform something called normalization. So a few interesting things about Prajna just at the level of encoding it on a file. Let's look at algorithm. Um, Arabic is a right to left language, so we start at this end. and. Um, but when we actually type the darn thing in, we type it the way that we say it. A, L, K, and so on. Um, and it is stored the way that you type it. It's stored in logical order. So you have this idea that there's a logical order and there's a display order. And they might not be the same. Uh, I want you to look at the red letters. Uh, that is the L and the K of algorithm. Uh, you'll see that they're joined together. Arabic, um, unlike uh, Western scripts, is a calligraphic script. So the model that we have is not putting little letters together, but it's taking a brush and keeping our brush on the page. Um, and so there's a lot of ways that the letters are joined together. In some senses, the, uh, the L and the K function is just like a ligature. There's not much difference between that and the FFI that we saw in official. Um, but Arabic does one more thing that's quite interesting. Um, look at the letter M. You will see that there's a quite uh, a big difference between the green letter M as we've typed it in and the green letter M, M that is displayed. Can you see that? Which one is green? Uh, it's, it, it's in that sort of last block of text on the left. Um, what happens is that because this is a brush script, um, there are different ways of representing the same letter, the same sound, depending on where you are in the stroke. If you're at the beginning of the stroke, you write an M in a particular way. 
If you're in the middle of a stroke, it looks more like a loop. If you're at the end of the stroke, it's got a loop with a little tail on it. And that is how we would expect Arabic to be um, displayed. Um, so how is that represented in uh, Unicode? Well, if you just have the letter M on its own, it's this code point of 645. If you have it in initial position, it's the same one. And if you have it in medial or final, it's all the same code point. Um, so this is because Unicode is encoding uh, the semantics of a character. It is encoding the fact that this is a, a Arabic letter M. And it doesn't care how you display it. That's somebody else's problem. Whose problem? We'll see a little bit later. Um, but uh, I said that it's a brush script, but I'm sure you've noticed that not all of the, the word is connected together. There are breaks. There's a break at the R. There's a break at the A. Some letters don't connect with the other letters. And there's a bunch of information in the Unicode standard about what uh, letters join with other letters. But the main point about Arabic is that what you see is not what you type. There is a process of combining that into the written Arabic that we would expect to see printed. Now, software. How do we even read this thing? Um, well, it's not left to right, and it's not right to left either. In fact, it goes a bit like this. Start at the red one, and it goes like that, and then it goes down a bit, and then it goes down a bit further, then it goes right, then it goes left, <laughs> then it goes right again. Um, what's going on here is that um, uh, Telugu, and there's a bunch of Indian scripts that are not alphabets, but abudigas. And the way that these work, they, each letter has an implied vowel. So if you look on the far left, there is a, a, a letter sa. But we don't want to say software, we want to say software. So we need to modify that letter to change the implicit vowel to a different vowel. When we want to say software with no vowel on the fa, we need to put another uh, mark called a vowel killer. Uh, onto the fa, onto the ta, um, and change the vowels. And at the end, we don't want software, we want software. So again, another vowel killer. Um, this uh, piece of text is made of, out of three glyphs in the font. And they, uh, the green piece, they may not be the ones that you uh, uh, expect. But I want you to look at this first one you'll see that in the, uh, the reading order, in the things that we've typed in, um, the vowel sign here applies to va. It's part of soft ver. But when it's displayed, the convention in this language is that it goes onto the head of the, the syllable cluster. So even though that air refers to the va, it's displayed on top of the fa. This is, yeah, not a very easy language. So there is a reordering that's happening somewhere to get this to display correctly. And again, there are different glyphs in the font that this is made out of. I've been talking about fonts. Um, what is a font? I don't know if you've ever asked yourself that question. Here is a font, and you might think of it as, well, it's just a bunch of shapes and a bunch of letters. This is a, a font that uh, I designed from some graffiti in an apartment block near my house. And yeah, in one sense, it's a, it's a bunch of letters. But what is a font file? Um, let's have a look, shall we? Uh, let's have a look at that file. Nope, that's turned up over here. Yep, it's, uh, it's a hex file. So let's turn on hex mode and see if we can see anything useful about it. Uh, we can see that it starts with the word Otto. Uh, it's an open type uh, font, and that's the, uh, the signature for an open type font. And there's a bit of gobbledygook, and then we start to see some patterns. 
CFF, and then 8 bits of stuff. G pos, 8 bits of stuff. G sub, 8 bits of stuff. OS2. Anyone heard of OS2 before? What's that doing there? CMAP, head, HHE. What's going on here is that a font is actually a database. This is a list of database tables. Um, and there's a piece of software called TTX, uh, which we can use to turn this binary font into XML and to investigate what's going on in those tables. Here is a list of tables. Oops. Let's do that again. Here's the list. We're missing something off the end, aren't we? There they are. Each table has got a tag, a table name. It's got a checksum. It's got uh, various data in it. We're not going to look at all of those tables, but maybe we'll have a look at a few of them. So this is, this is what's going on inside a font. Um, the open type format is extensible. You can actually have whatever tables you like in there. And if the software doesn't know what to do with them, it'll just ignore them. Um, and this means that, uh, for instance, you can uh, write your own rendering software, which uh, picks up on your particular tables. This is something that uh, SIL, which is a community of linguists, have done. Um, for some of the things that OpenType can't normally handle, they've added their own data in there in their own tables, because it's just a database. Um, and then we've got uh, one of those tables is OS2, and like a database, it's got some stuff in it. So actually, very little of an OpenType font is the little black squiggles. It's not really very much about the outlines. There's a whole chunk of metadata uh, about the font itself, about how wide things are, how big things are, how tall they are, and then there's some advanced typography features which we'll have a look at a bit later. So, um, let's start with this OS2 table. Um, in fact, we're going to dump that one out in TTX as well, just for you to have a look at if I can get to the thing. So TTX allows us to say output to standard output. Have a look at table OS2. That's not a two. And, and there it is. Here's a bunch of data from inside that font. If we have a look at the top of it, uh, there's some things like the average character width, uh, the subscript size. And so this is some global metrics data, how big things are in the font. And if you know how big things are in the font, you can start to lay things out. You, um, uh, just like uh, using movable type, we can have a, a piece of type which is yay big, and then we can put things next to it. Uh, why is it called OS2? Well, open type is full of compromises, and open type is very old. Um, and it was really the merger of a bunch of stuff from Apple, from Microsoft. Um, there was the true type. Uh, standard, there was the Adobe Type 1 format, and it just kind of put them all in different tables and just put them all together. Um, so you actually have a bunch of conflicting or duplicating information. The OS2 table uh, carries the horizontal metric, the vertical metrics, uh, but it's only read by Windows. Um, and Mac have got another uh, table in there, the HHEA table, where they read their vertical metrics from, and they're both in the same font, and they're not always the same values. That's always what happens if you have a database with the same data in it in two places. Um, so now we know how, how tall things are. Uh, we need to know how wide things are if we're going to lay them out and display them. And so there's another table called HMTX. Uh, I'm not going to dump this one out in... in TTX, but uh, here's a subset of it. And that says how wide the whole thing is. Uh, these numbers are all given in font units, but because fonts are scalable, it doesn't really matter how big a font unit is. You're going to multiply it by something. Um, it's just rel relative to the, the m square, we call it. So how wide is our s? Well, we can see it is 479 units wide. And then each font has got normally some space to the left or the right of the character, um, so that there's a bit of space around it. Uh, the left side bearing and the right side bearing. 
So we start um, our conceptual box of type uh, at one point, and then when we draw the outlines, when we render them, uh, we'll render them 23 units across. You might notice that some of these LSBs left side bearings are negative. How can that be possible? Well, if you have a, a font that does things like this and juts into the letters behind, you need to go back behind where the letter should start and draw it over there. So now we know how big our characters are, we know how wide they are, how tall they are. We can start placing uh, the, these conceptual boxes together. And the layout system that we use doesn't care what's in those boxes doesn't really care about the outlines at all. All layout systems care about is how many boxes can I fit on a line, how many lines can I fit on a page, um, and so, and where do I need to start rasterizing the contents when I do care about them. So, does that tell us everything we need to know to lay out Latin text, even the simplest of Latin text? Well, not really, actually, because uh, kerning is something that needs to be taken into consideration. And this is where we get into the advanced typography part that is the, the new thing in OpenType, the smarts. You can actually program your fonts to do various things. Uh, one of the tables is GPARS, and we can use that to move glyphs around. Um, the, the way that it's represented in the font structure is horribly complicated, and so generally everyone uses uh, what's called a feature specification language. This was invented by Adobe. Um, and this is part of the source, I guess, for Adobe Garamond Pro, this font here. And what it says is that whenever you see a letter that's a bit like an A, and we'll define this class of letters that's a bit like an A, it's got A with a ring, A with a tilde, all of these things, and then if it's followed by a V, you need to squish these two things 100 units closer. That's how uh, kerning works. Now, generally, we think of kerning as horizontal. Just move them a bit closer, a bit further away. Um, but the open type spec leaves things quite open, and there are actually four different dimensions that you can move things around. You can move the X placement, and you can move the side bearings. Uh, and you can move them in the Y dimension as well. You can do uh, vertical kerning. So if you like, you could do something like this. So that's the sort of thing that you can do in the GPOS uh, table. Another thing that it allows us to do is, let's say that we want the character N with a dot underneath. Uh, again, this is something that would be used for, say, Sanskrit. But our font doesn't have the N with the dot underneath. The font designer has not designed every single combination of accents and characters. But what the font designer has done is said, if you're going to attach a diacritic to the bottom, attach it here. And if you're going to um, attach a dot to the bottom of something, that's where I want you to join the two things together. That's expressed in the feature code like that, and that allows you to create characters that your font doesn't actually have. Now, when I did the example of vertical kerning, I used the word nastalik. Uh, and the reason I use that word is because um, there's a style of Arabic calligraphy called nastalik. Uh, when we're talking about Latin and when we're talking about uh, text layout, we tend to use the model of Western printing, that we have a baseline and we have a bunch of stuff that we align on a line. And you can do that in Arabic. There's a style of Arabic called nash that does that. But in nastalik, there is no baseline. Things can go like this, they can go like this, they can go like this. Um, and so one of the things that you will need to do to make this work is to sew your different bits of uh, glyphs together to ensure that the start position of one matches up with the end position of the other. So here's an example of that. Um, here are three Arabic characters which are being glued together. And the way that they're being glued together is that... Uh, there are two anchors divided in the script. Start the stroke here, come in here, come out here. If we didn't have those anchors and we just line things up baseline to baseline, it would look like that. So, uh, again, inside the font you have a bunch of information that says uh, when you're joining characters together, this is where you should start, this is where you should, 
you should end. And something is responsible for making it all line up. What's the something? Well, one more table to look at before we explain the something. The last table is called G-sub, and uh, this is a lot of fun. This allows you to manipulate the input text. So if I see the letters F and I in the input text, I'm not going to output the glyphs F and I. I'm going to output this glyph phi. And that al allows us to do all sorts of fun things. You can change the form at the start of a, uh, a text. You can change the form at the end of a text. You could have different uh, length glyphs that expand over different um, lengths of text. Um, what I've done here in this last one is that if I've got two small letters together and a T in the middle, I make the T pop up a bit. Um, again, that's the sort of stuff that you can do with the G sub table. Uh, there was an example, I think, last year of a font called uh, Sans Bullshit Sans. I apologize for the language, but this can do things like this. So this is the kind of thing that you could do with contextual substitutions. So what is the thing that, that makes all this work? Well, there is a process of taking a text, taking a font with all that programming information about what to do with the text, and marrying the two together. And that's called shaping. Um, and the shaper that uh, is often used on Linux is one called HalfBuzz. Uh, it's a Persian word. Um, Harf means type and buzz means open, so it's just open type version. Um, and this works with your text and your font to produce the output. Um, Half buzz comes with a bunch of useful um, uh, debugging tools, which we're going to have a look at. First one is called HB Shape. So, how did the word photon, let's say, come out the way it did? Well, HalfBuzz looked at the text, it looked at the font, and it said, you want letter P, you want letter H, you want letter O, and you want a letter T wide, which is the one that is selected when it's between two small glyphs, um, and then O, and then you want O final at the end. Um, and there's another fun thing that you can do with HalfBuzz. You can actually make it produce an ANSI version of the... Uh, the string. So now I think we've got a clue as to what happens when our words uh, come from the disk, hit a font, and get rendered on the screen. When the word official arrives into half buzz, it brings a font with it, um, and half buzz says, You've got a letter O, it's 498 units. And then you've got this ligature FFI, which is 825 units. And HalfBuzz also tells us, quite helpfully, uh, at what index in the string uh, those letters refer to. Um, Prajna is the same. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the input comes pre-composed or not, whether you've got a macron as a single character or whether you've got a combining macron. HalfBuzz has to sort that out. And... Uh, then it can tell us, we want a P, we want an R, we want an A, we want a dotless J, and then we want to combine the tilde 266 units across. So that's how that combination, which isn't in the font, gets rendered. And there is an A macron in the font, so it's able to, to use that glyph directly. What about when we do Arabic? Well... Uh, we need to tell half buzz the direction. Uh, this needs to be right to left text. If you don't tell it it's right to left text, you're going to get horrible gobbledygook coming out. It's not actually reordering the text. That's something we'll look at in a little bit. But it is telling you, even though the text is read left to right, you are going to output it right. Um, even though the text is read right to left, you are going to output it in the same order that you would output everything else. So it tells you the glyph at the end first, and then how much you need to move to get to the next one. And then Telugu. Um, it knows 
all this thing that we've said about the difference between lexical clusters and graphical clusters, it knows that the air of software has to go onto the far. So half buzz is reordering that text. It is clustering it into syllables. There is a lot of knowledge about Indian scripts that needs to be baked into this piece of software before it can display anything for you. Um, that is going to change in the future. Um, Microsoft have come out with something called a universal shaping engine, where all of this data will be part of the Unicode database. And it won't need specialist knowledge about Indian scripts but it will just be able to derive it from the data that uh, comes from the Unicode database. I don't know any more about it than that. Um, you'll notice also that it's chosen not just the right glyphs from the font, but the right variants of those fonts, um, of those glyphs. The one on the left that looks like a big S is a variant that um, is to be used when it's on the end of a consonant cluster. So all of this information is in the font. Half buzz is, rep is responsible for making it work. So we know what glyphs we're, we're trying to put together. Now let's put them into a PDF. In fact, let's just do that. So here's our example of official. This is a style document. It's very simple. It just says we want an A5 document. It's going to be now a bit uh, Garman Pro. I don't want any page numbers, and I just want the word official. Sile will run that and turn it into a PDF. Um, and that PDF is 2.5K. So what's inside this PDF? Uh, it's not hex. It just wants you to believe that it's hex. Actually, if we open it up again, you'll find that there's, that there's something semi-structured going on in here. But um, there's some compression happening as well, and that's why Sublime Text thought it was uh, a binary file. Let's decompress it. There's a, a utility called PDFTK, which can do various things with PDFs. And one of the things that it can do is, is expand all those compressed streams. Now let's have a look at it again. PDFs are basically. Uh, flat files, uh, which contain a bunch of stuff. Here's one stuff. Um, this is a, has a type catalog, some pages. Uh, here's some stuff, which is how big the page is. Um, and if we look down, we'll see uh, some fonts and some other things going on. So what are these uh, stuff made up from? What are What's going on inside our PDF? PDFs contain a lot of these dictionaries, hashes, uh, you might call them in some programming languages. Um, and here's one that says, ordering is identity, registry is Adobe Solomon is zero. They can contain arrays. Um, they can also contain objects. Objects are kind of like nodes in a tree, and they can refer to ob other objects somewhere else. So here's the first object. Um, and it, it's a catalog object, and it's got pages, but pages is another object somewhere else. Pages is object number two. Uh, there's something called generation, but nobody ever uses that. So what's going on is that PDF is fundamentally, it's, it's a way to represent a tree structure. Much like a font, most of it is actually metadata. If a font is a database, uh, PDF is a way to, rep to serialize trees. In fact, given the ubiquity of PDF processes in software, it may be, make sense to use PDF as a way of storing tree-like data structures. PDF as a document format has got far more in common with JSON than it has with languages like PostScript. Um, how are the fonts stored in PDF? I just want you to have a look at the W table. Um, this is the font metrics that we saw earlier, but you'll notice that it is only contains the metrics of the glyphs that it actually uses. So PDF has taken a font and said, actually, you're only going to use this bit, this bit, this bit. I'm only going to give you that information. It's subset it. Why do we need the metrics? Well, um, because when we come to drawing, uh, there's a part called the page content stream. This is a bit more like PostScript. This is a bunch of drawing operations that actually get the text onto the page. 
Um, first thing we do is turn the reference upside down. So um, uh, in PDF, normally 0, 0 is bottom left. We have a transform that turns 0, 0 to top left. Um, and then we choose our font. That's what the line in green does. And that goes through the fonts dictionary. It has looked for a font called F1, which turns out to be Garmin Pro. That's useful. Um, and then finally, we draw it. Now, you can use ordinary text. You can use ordinary ASCII text. Um, but uh, what we're doing here is using glyph IDs. So these are the IDs within the font. The reason we do that is that we can access things like the FFI. We can access all the strange Toluga glyphs that are not encoded in Unicode. So what's going on there? We have 0050, which is ID80, which is O. Oh, and then the next one is the FFI. So there we go. We've gone from some text. Uh, we've gone from some fonts. We've put it into a shaper like half buzz. We've split it up, and we've written it out as a PDF. One more very quick problem. Uh, I mentioned bidirectional reordering. Re what happens if you have some text which starts out in a left-to-right language, like English, and then goes into a right-to-left language? Well, what happens depends very much on how big your line is, um, because you're, you still have to read the Hebrew right-to-left, right-to-left. Uh, if we make a smaller line, then we have to uh, reorder things and jiggle them around. So Unicode has a specification for how to do this, the Unicode BIDI algorithm. And what it does is it, it groups tokens into different uh, runs of direction. Uh, the green ones go right to left, the red ones go left to right. It gives them a nesting order, because you could actually have Arabic within English within Hebrew. So you might need to nest several levels deep. When we've got a nesting order, we can then um, reorder those tokens. We swap them around, and that gives us the order that we need to write them out in the same direction. And similarly, if you're going to do things the other way around, you could swap those around and work from the right to the left. There we are, the journey of a word. Official and a font come together. They get shaped by half buzz. That produces a bunch of glyph IDs. They get uh, broken into lines, and they get turned into PDF drawing instructions. Uh, if you want to know more about this, I have an open source book which is in progress called Fonts and Layout for Global Scripts. You can Google it and start reading it already. But uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to be able to take them. That's a great talk. Um, what was the word you used to describe the Telugu alphabet? It was alpha it's Abu Diga. Abu Diga. How's that? What, what distinction is that from an alphabet? Um, because each letter, each consonant, has a implicit vowel, right. um, which may be changed with marks. Mind-boggling presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I compiled a couple of programs, and suddenly the dependencies suddenly required half buzz. And I was yes. wondering whether, just for normal English, that was a requirement. Yes, because as we saw in the case of official, the font might say these three characters need to be merged into one. So anything, any kind of display w may need shaping. You don't know. Hey, could you bring up the Telugu uh, example again? I think so. Must be a quicker way to do it. Yes, I can. So I I can see where the vowel killer is on the on the ra. Yep. But I I don't actually see where it is on the on the intermediate bits. Is that what what am I missing? <laughs> um, let me see which one we got. Oh, we got the one on the far, which has become this air. Yes. Sorry, which has become... Uh, so this one has taken its place. 
Ah. <laughs> right. So is the fact that they're, they're, they're displayed as a... As a a co consonant a cluster, cluster. That's implicitly killing the vowels. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, just one question. So the very first example, when you said there is an OSX bug, is it a bug in the font or...? No. No. It is a bug in OSX. Uh, we've reported it to the Cortex team and they're looking at it because the very same font and the very same characters get shaped differently on Linux. What is the component with the bug? What is... So it's the called the shaper. The shaper. Okay. The shaper in Linux is half buzz. The shaper in OS X is okay. uh, Cortex. The shaper on Windows is Uniscribe. Okay, thank you. Um, this is really fun. Do you have any suggestions for resources for someone who's totally new to making fonts that wants to learn how to do it? Uh, again, when my book is finished, that would be it. Great. Um, <laughs> um, making fonts in general, or yeah. making um, the. Uh, Yes, I will see you afterwards because I can't remember okay. the name of it. Cool. <laughs> yep. I'm a little worried the answer may be somewhat terrible here, <laughs> but for supporting all of these crazy different fonts, I imagine you quite frequently run into situations where linguistic scholars change their mind about the right way to do something. <laughs> Um, how does that work? Um, mm. Yeah, I have not experienced that. I've experienced it within style at uh, the language support level, where you have to make decisions about um, when to break up words. So in Thai, uh, you don't use hyphens, but you can break it at different points within the word. You can break a line and then just carry on the word on the next line. Um, and there have been different libraries for breaking Thai, which give different results. That's not been fun. <laughs> and to follow on to that, how do you decide who to trust if there are multiple authorities claiming co um, contradicting things about the way a given language should be written? The Unicode Consortium. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, I uh, learned an awful lot about uh, language and font rendering, um, but you seem to have entirely omitted emoji. I was just wondering if you're making a statement at all by omitting it from your conversation, because it seems quite the topic. It is, but in a sense, there's nothing all that interesting about emoji. Emoji get interesting when you're doing things like colour fonts, because you, you can have emoji that get rendered in different colours. Um, but from a a printing perspective, they're just another box with some stuff in it and we don't care about that stuff. Mm, fair enough. I think that's cool. pretty much uh, it. We're into afternoon tea time now. Thank you very yep. much. Again. And thank you. Thank you.